Hi, and welcome to the house Guadalajara. I'm Justin. My wife, Angela, and I are the pastors here. And uh, again, this week we're filming in our actual church location, which during the week is a coffee shop on Sundays. Back in the day, it would be full of people. Now it's pretty empty on Sundays. And uh, it makes me miss everybody. So from my heart, from this building, from our church to you, I uh, just want to let you know that we're praying for you and that we uh, hope to be able to be back together again soon. If we've met in person, if you've been here physically, that's awesome. And again, can't wait to see you again. If maybe you've started connecting online over the last few months, uh, maybe you're even connecting with another part of the world, that's also awesome. And hopefully someday we'll be able to meet in person. If you're ever in Guadalajara, stop by. It's an amazing city and really love being here, be, love being this part of this church here and doing what we're doing. Um, each week we talk about different topics that have to do with life and God and the Bible. And if you've seen very many of these videos or if you met me again in person, you probably realized that really the, the approach that we typically take, I, it's the approach I take in my own life, honestly. And it's, it's basically that each one of us has the ability and the right and the responsibility and uh, the obligation and the freedom and the joy of knowing God for ourselves and of being able to kind of grow in understanding and knowledge of God. I, I think if there's one thing that should characterize people that are seeking God, it should be the willingness and the ability to, to grow and to change our minds, to not feel like we know everything. And I actually want to talk a little bit about that today. Um, but before I get into that, starting a week ago, we began this seri a series called God Up Close. And the idea is really understanding, actually, I don't even want to use that word because understanding is maybe more than we could expect in, in certain contexts related to God. I think the idea of knowing God is more than an understanding. It's more than an intellect. Knowing God is this idea of being close to him. It is, it is intellect. It is logic. It is understanding things. But more than that, it's, I just have this passion, this desire the last few months especially. I really want to know God up close. I want to see God in my life. I want to know he's with me and at work in me. And it's funny because there's been so much um, so there's so much noise. There's so much um, information flying around out there in, in so many different areas. I mean, 2020 is going to be like the brunt of the jokes for the next 20 years of our lives. You know, this year has just gone from bad to worse in so many ways. There's so many things happening. And in the middle of all that, it's easy to, to get a little stressed out trying to figure everything out, to get a little bit overwhelmed, trying to understand and grow and learn. And, and let me say up front, that's important. That is essential that we learn and grow. I felt more, more kind of desire and more passion in my own heart, in my own mind to learn and to grow and understand topics. I mean, everything from, from racism to political systems to uh, different ways that prejudice and bias work to different understandings of scripture to um, even evaluating beliefs and theologies and doctrines and understanding of different topics in the Bible and what sin is and what it isn't and what God, ex God expects from us. There's just this never-ending list of things that, um, that we, we probably have all looked at and thought about it. You know, I'm sure you have your own list. And in the middle of this kind of like growth and you know, almost desperate sometimes search for understanding, um, maybe partly because the world just feels like it's turned upside down. In the middle of all that, we don't want to lose God. And, and I mentioned last week that sometimes um, we can think that to approach God, we have to have all these things in order. So like our, our holiness and our understanding and our doctrine and you know, maybe our church attendance or maybe some other religious uh, belief or tradition or system. And, and sometimes, and I, and, I, and I say this as a pastor, and I say this literally sitting in a church building, and I love the Bible. I studied I studied it for years. I still study it all the time. I really do see the power of, of, of the Bible to change our lives. So, so with this background kind of, of seeing the importance of all these tools and all these contexts to help us know God, I, I want to say up front that none of those things are necessary to know God. To know God, you just need God. Like God can reveal himself to each one of us directly, personally, powerfully at any moment. That's his prerogative because, again, he's God. So the rest of the things that we do are, are not bad. They're good. Often they're good. Sometimes they get in the way. Sometimes they help. And I think as, as humans, as people, it is important for us to not get distracted with the craziness and the chaos and the learning curve of life. And sometimes the learning curve 
of God and forget that God is really just with us all the time and his love is so real and his peace is more necessary than ever before. And so I want to talk today and maybe for a few weeks to come about some different facets of this kind of dichotomy or um, it's, it's really a duality of, of having on one side the importance of truth and growth and change and knowledge and learning and, and expanding our minds and, and on the other side this understanding that God is actually above all that. He supersedes all that. Um, and I want to try to merge the two because we can't stop growing. We can't not grow. But we also can't make our religion or our spirituality about, about just knowledge. It really is about God. It starts with God. It's sustained by God. It ends with God. It's focused on God. And God's focused on us and his love towards us and his grace and his forgiveness. Um, even when we don't know what we're doing, we don't know what's going on. So I've, I've just kind of had all these thoughts bouncing around my brain for a while now. So um, I'm going to share a few of them today. Um, John 4 is a story that's just, it's a, it's a powerful story in so many ways. I mentioned it last week. I'm going to read a very small portion of it and make a few comments. And it just won't be a super long video, but I, I probably will be a little bit passionate because I, I can just almost like feel, I hope it's God, you know, just this passion for knowing God more. And I, and I, and I wouldn't be surprised if you felt the same thing, maybe mixed with sometimes a frustration um, about God, maybe even contradictions about your faith, maybe doubts, maybe anger, maybe feelings of betrayal or of, I don't know, like you're, you're not sure what you believe anymore. And I, I want to talk today a little bit about those feelings and kind of how to process them. And I'm not going to give you the answers because I'm still learning them, but I want to talk about the importance of that process. And I actually, if you want to have a, a title or a subtitle for this, I mentioned it's called God Up Close, you know, part two, I guess, but kind of a subtitle would be the power of doubt, the power of doubt. And doubt is usually associated with weakness. You know, we think about doubting as synonymous with spiritual immaturity, maybe, or with, um, I don't know, rebellion or something kind of like bad, right? So if I doubt something, that, that's a sign of weakness or that's a sign of, um, I don't know, like I'm not going to be able to progress. So we actually in our lives often try to get rid of doubt. We try to find answers in every area. And I'm, I'm not just talking about spirituality or Christianity or the Bible. I'm talking about in every area of life, you want to know the answers because it gives you strength, gives you confidence, gives you um, just the, the steps you needed to take to, to move forward. And yet when it comes to God, there's so much we don't know. And when it comes to life, frankly, there's so much we don't know. So I think sometimes we get a little confused by the relationship of doubt and faith. And we start to feel like if I have doubt, I don't have faith. If I have fears, I don't have trust and confidence in God. And that can actually lead us to some dangerous conclusions, dangerous for ourselves and dangerous for other people. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So again, John 4, um, we, we meet uh, a, a Samaritan woman at a well. Jesus has an encounter with this, this woman, a conversation with her that lasted potentially an hour or two hours. We don't know as the, the disciples had been sent into town to get food. Jesus is sitting by a well in this region of Israel called Samaria. It wasn't a foreign nation, but it wasn't really part of Israel either. It was a group of people that the Israelites rejected because of their religion, which was very similar to Judaism, but slightly different. And one of the key differences, and this is important in the story, was where you worshipped. So the Samaritans in this area said, you have to worship Jesus, excuse me, you have to worship God uh, it, on Mount Gerizim. It was this mountain right near the town where Jesus was at in this moment. The Jews said you have to worship God in Jerusalem. That's where the temple was. That's where the sacrifices were made. That's where the high priest was. And so there's this, literally for hundreds of years, there had been this argument about where God was meant to be worshipped, where God was at, where God was contained, where God was limited. Now, they didn't use those words. But I want you to kind of follow the, the train of thought. If God is in a temple over there, or if God is in a, in a, on a mountain up here, then in a sense, I have confined God to my ability to grasp him. It's my initiative to go see him. It's my prerogative to interact with him. It's my effort to find him that matters. Now, the problem with that is that God is so much bigger than a mountain or a temple. And when we limit him to one place or one strategy 
but one spiritual discipline or one interpretation of scripture or one spiritual label or one physical location, we have, we have undermined the essence of God. We've, we've made him, in a sense, less than us. And then it becomes more about our control and our, our prerogatives and rights and, and efforts. Now, I don't mean to sound too like mysterious or too philosophical with this, but it gets really practical um, in our lives the way we work this out. So let me, let me read this. I keep getting distracted. I'm trying to read John 4. The woman said to him, so the woman's talking to Jesus, and she's had this conversation. She's realized that this guy has uh, a, a lot more to say than the average traveler that was, would maybe have stopped looking for water. And so she says, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you people say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. So she just jumps right into this theological debate. She wants to know the answer to the most pressing question on her mind. How do you worship God? What's the way that God wants to be worshiped? Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You people worship what you do not know. So speaking of the Samaritans, the Samaritans worship what they do not know. We, the Jews, worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming, and now is here. So he's kind of like, you know, hey, the time's coming. Actually, it's right here, right now, and it's through me. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and the people who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And there is so much more I could say about this passage, and actually it goes on longer than this. It's, a, it's an incredible conversation, a life-changing conversation with this woman, and results in actually the entire town understanding that Jesus had been sent by God as the Messiah, the Savior. The whole town's transformed. But this piece here is fascinating to me when she tries to put God in a box. And she tries to say how, where, when, who, what are the strategies and the rituals by which God can be approached. And Jesus just says, yeah, you know what? So um, let me tell you something here. It's not a temple and it's not a mountain. It's not male or female because she's a woman, which would have been socially unacceptable for him to even speak to her. It's not even about Jew or Samaritan. It's not about any of the, the, the labels and the limits and even the good things, the strategies we put into place that supposedly help us get closer to God. Those are not the things that take us to God. He says God needs to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. In other words, there's no barriers. There's nothing between God and us. There's no religion, there's no ritual, there's no, no, no tradition, no doctrine that has to be like put in the middle because God is with us. And Jesus is sitting in front of her saying this to her right then and right there. So I'm not undermining the Bible or tradition or theology or any of those things. Those have their place. Obviously, what you believe about Jesus affects everything. So there's, uh, you know, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying when I'm talking about the importance of just coming close to God. What I'm trying to emphasize here is the importance and the preeminence of God in this process. We don't find God. We don't approach God. We don't convince God. He is with us already. That's the message of Jesus. So I'd like to pray to get started here. And then I want to share just a few brief thoughts kind of about what um, this crazy process could look like of understanding God better, even when that understanding is maybe more full of question marks than it is affirmations, when there's more things we don't know than things that we do know. So if you'd like to join me, let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your presence and for your love. Thank you for your revelation. Even though we don't understand everything, we don't know so much. But Lord, we do know this. We know that you're with us. We know that you love us. We know that you've found us and chosen us. And we know that you are, are guiding our steps, God. We know that even in the craziness of life and so much happening, that you actually are still just as secure and strong and loving as ever. Pray that you give us a peace, Lord, that passes understanding, an ability to understand more, but not to rely on our own understanding, Lord, to, to actually rely on you and to be able to share that with others as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have three kids. Um, if you have children, you've probably understood the barrage of questions that come out of their mouths, especially when they're about five, six, seven years old. If you don't have kids, maybe nephews, nieces, or maybe you've just seen it with others, um, it's awesome and, uh, and kind of terrifying all at the same time because it's insatiable, this desire to understand the universe. And you got to give them a break. Everything's new, right? Everything's wonderful. Everything is fresh. So I can remember my kids asking me questions, uh, you know, nonstop for a 45-minute car trip. Now, how do volcanoes work? And why does the moon shine in the daytime? And where does this happen? And what's you know, where, where does this come from? And just questions about everything under the sun. And, you know, as a parent, like when they're like three or four, you can say almost anything and they'll totally believe you. Um, 
Five, six, seven it has to have some amount of logic behind it. Nine, 10, 11, you know, they've already got at that point a frame of reference to really judge what you're saying. And then after about 13, they're not even asking you questions anymore, right? Because it's like teenage years, they know the answers. So there's this, this window of opportunity where you are the source, the, the, the primary source of information about the universe to your children, and they will believe everything you tell them. And it's terrifying because, um, you know, first of all, because it never stops. It just, it, just, it just never, ever stops. And then secondly, because what you say, they just absorb it. They just pick it up. Um, it's, it's not like they have any reason to not believe that what you're telling them about how volcanoes work is, is true. I mean, you could say anything you wanted, and it, that, that would go down in their mind, like, nope, my dad said it. Nope, my mom said it. Now, maybe they, maybe they would question that years down the road, but your brain, and I, you know, I'm not a psychologist. I've always wondered how, how it is that the first thing you hear seems to be the thing you believe the hardest, the thing you believe the most about a topic. So if I have no frame of reference for whatever random topic and someone tells me something, that becomes my kind of like my belief system. And then everything else is filtered through that belief and, and it becomes harder and harder to change. And it's fascinating how a child is used to changing their mind and a child is used to saying, I don't know, and is used to asking questions to the point that as parents, you're just like, hey, that's enough questions for now. Like, let's put on a movie or something. But yet, as adults, sometimes we become more used to expressing our opinions. You know, we don't have as many question marks in our conversations. We don't have as many times where we say, you're right, I never thought of that. It's, it's almost like we're expected to have a lot of answers. We're expected to have a lot of opinions. And I don't think that's always healthy. I, I think that the more you grow and the more you study and learn, the more questions you should ask and the more questions you should have. And when it comes to your faith, you know, I just, I really believe that we need to give ourselves permission to question things. We need to give ourselves permission to doubt things. We need to give ourselves permission to ask for evidence and to look at hard things and contradictions at confusing things and come to conclusions or at the very least make progress in our opinions about things on our own and with the, with the help of others, of course, and clearly using the means that God has given us, which includes your logic and asking advice and of course the Bible and your own relationship with God. There's so many things, I'm not even gonna try to get into them right now, there's so many things that inform our minds. So I'm not saying you just flip a coin and oh, I'm just gonna make a decision randomly, no. But I think that it, the, the flip side of this process is sometimes we can be so afraid of doubt and so afraid of, com of, of complex questions that don't have easy answers that we can stiff arm them. Say, no, don't, you can't come into my life. And we can have this reaction of, of fear because our theology is at times almost a house of cards. You know, and if one thing gets pulled out, the whole thing can come flying down or, or at least we're afraid that's going to happen. But you know, God is not that fragile, and he's not that worried about our questions. And I think there is actually a great power hidden within the ability to ask hard questions. I see it in Jesus. I see it in the disciples. They were asking, they were like little children. Jesus, what about this? And Jesus, what about that? And some of their questions were pretty crazy. The one that sticks out in my mind was one time, I think it was James and I forget which other one. They were like, hey, Jesus, so this village over here that just rejected us, would you like us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Like that was their question to Jesus. And I don't know how Jesus responded exactly. I mean, I don't know his facial expressions. He did say, hey, you don't really know the spirit, that's, you know, the attitude, the, the, the mindset behind what you're saying. I don't know if he was laughing. I don't know if he was freaked out. I don't know what his reaction was, but those are the kind of questions these guys were asking. Do you want us to just kill them all? Like, we'll do that for you, Jesus. You know, they, they rejected you. Could we just like a little fire and brimstone right now? Just boom, that would be kind of cool. And Jesus is, he just gently says, no, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to do that today. No, we're going to try a different approach, like maybe love, maybe patience. And his approach to their crazy questions was not one of just slamming them down their throat. And it definitely wasn't one of saying, how dare you ask that question? He, he doesn't condemn the human journey of struggling with contradictions, of struggling with frustrations. And I'm not just talking, I'm not even mostly talking about crazy theological debates that people have had for centuries that we will never resolve. 
you know, things in Revelations maybe, or things in other parts of the Bible that you're just like, I, I have no idea what that means. I'm talking about some of the things that are pretty basic, you know, like, I don't know, how do you forgive somebody? That's really hard. You know, if it, maybe they cut you off in traffic, that's not a big deal. If you can't forgive someone for cutting you off in traffic pretty quick, you might need some help, right? But I'm talking about a major thing in your life that happened, and maybe six months later, you're still struggling with it, maybe six years later. And you're like, I don't understand. I don't, I can't. And then, and then this is what happens. Because you can't align your emotions or your thoughts with, with what you've been told or what you perceive to be the approach of the Bible or of God towards that topic, you begin to feel guilty. Well, how come I can't forgive that person? How come it's not easy for me? Maybe there's something wrong with me. And, and then we, we start like this spiral sometimes of guilt and rejection and fear and self-hate, even where, where you don't. You don't give yourself room to simply say, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I'm confused. I'm hurting. I'm frustrated. You, know, you could say the same about tragedies in life. Like, how come God lets some things happen? I don't know. I mean, I can tell you some things I've learned. I can tell you some things that have helped me when I've gone through tragedies that were incomprehensible in the moment. Some things I didn't learn until years later, looking back and saying, oh, now... Now that actually makes a little bit more sense, but still some of it doesn't make sense if I'm honest. And I think I'm going to have a long list of questions when I get to heaven about what exactly God was thinking in certain scenarios. So my, my point isn't so much that, it's not at all that we should just give up and throw out the window any hope of ever understanding God. Not at all. I think quite the contrary. I think the more you're, you spend time with anybody, the more you get to know them. But you will never fully, totally understand even another human being. My wife and I have been married for 23 years. And I would like to say that I completely understand her and can predict her every whim and wish. And that would be a lie because time and again, probably every day, a reaction or a response or a thought takes me by surprise. Usually in a good way. Sometimes not so much. You know, and 23 years, like I know her better than anybody in the world. I know her better in some ways than I think I know myself. And yet she's a human being and she will respond and say things that are amazing, that things I would not have predicted, things that are different. How much more a relationship with God should amaze and surprise and sometimes confuse and frustrate us? If, if with a normal human relationship, we don't always get it right, and yet we still love, and we still laugh together, and we still enjoy company of other people, and yet Things happen. Things don't make sense. I, just, I, I really have this, this desire to know God in that way. Not, not just a mental, like, doctrinal way where I've got to have all my theological ducks in a row before I can be at peace, but a way where I just know God's with me. And you know what? I don't even know how to describe it, but I do. I know God is real. That's a journey each one of us takes on our own. I'm not going to try to impose mine on you. But I would like to say really clearly, if you have just a few doubts along the way, if there's a few things about the Bible that don't make sense, that actually contradict what you think God should be or should say, those are the questions that may lead you to know God the best. That you might not find all the answers. And for sure, the answers you come up with will not be what everybody else always believes because we don't all agree on anything. But the journey to know God and to understand what it means to love your fellow human and, and, to, it's, and to forgive, you know, and to navigate the, the complexities of life. It's that, it's that journey. It's that process. It's that relationship with God that really is what matters the most. It's really where we discover God and meet God the most. And I think sometimes there's these reactions that we need to watch out for. You know, the other day, um, I don't even know, I have no idea why, but all of a sudden I started having, like at night, waking up, just like my skin was just itching really bad, my arms and my legs, and it was miserable, I was like, well, this is weird, you know, what did I, am I allergic to something, I took a Benadryl, that didn't help, you know, trying to figure it out, so I googled it, because it happened four or five days in a row, and couldn't sleep for like an hour in the middle of the night, so I started googling itchy skin, well, that's just this rabbit hole of potential illnesses, right? You know, the first one's like, well, maybe your skin's just dry. Okay, that's great. That's easy to fix. But then it's like, or you could have cancer. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. There's, a, there's an enormous range of, um, of options, right, between dry skin and, and cancer. But I, I, have to, I have to look at the symptom and try to figure out what's 
underneath that. The itchy skin isn't just the problem. So, you know, it's a minor little thing. I mean, we hope it's minor, right? Um, but when it comes to sometimes our own reactions to maybe a truth or we don't think they're truths, but to a different opinion that someone shares with us, sometimes we, re we react in specific ways that actually could be indicative of underlying issues. And it's helpful as humans to take our emotional responses and say, well, okay, well, why did I react that way? So if you find yourself reacting with anger towards someone's theology or towards someone's belief system or towards someone's assumption, it could indicate that there's something in your own heart that might need to change. I'm not saying the person's right, but the, just this visceral response of anger, of defensiveness, sometimes, often, means that we are afraid of change or that we are afraid of challenging assumptions or that we are afraid that, again, you pull one card and the whole house of cards is going to come falling down. And I, I, I would love to just emphasize the, the danger of that on one side, right? The danger of just letting your theology and everything else and making it be so set in concrete because you're scared of changing it. Like, that can cause a lot of problems, can limit us very much. But on the other side, I would like to suggest that actually can be one of the most beautiful, exhilarating experiences in your life to ask yourself hard questions. And to say, God, I don't understand. I don't understand this area. Is this sin? Is this not sin? I don't understand this doctrine. How can you restrict this? I don't understand this belief system over here. I, I don't understand why my emotions are doing this. I, I don't understand how to process this person's betrayal of me. I, I don't understand how to respond. You know, there's so much we don't understand. And that's okay. That's the point. That's, that's okay to not understand all those things. But what we do know is that God's love and his presence have not changed. And as you're able to embrace doubt, you actually find a freedom in faith. Because you don't have to put God on a mountain or in a temple in order to believe in Him, in order to feel good about Him, in order to feel like, okay, I did my religious, my religious rituals and duties and I'm, I'm good with God, I'm okay with God. That's, that's false, we can't even do that because God's so much bigger than all those things. He's so much greater than any place, any action, any belief system. Any, he's bigger than all those things. And again, I'm not demeaning any of those things. But Jesus himself said, the day is here when we don't worship God in form and in fear and in doing these things that we think appease an angry God and gain his favor and you know, help us get everything in order so that the rest of our lives we can live them however we want. God's just with us. He, he came from heaven to earth in the form of Jesus. He ripped the veil in the temple as if to say, this is no longer the point. It's not about where and how and what exactly you have to do. It's about me. It's about God. A God is so much bigger than anything we could understand. And yeah, sometimes it will challenge our theology. Sometimes it will challenge our emotions. It will challenge our belief systems. It will challenge our traditions. It will challenge even our relationships with other people. Because as we face problems in this world, which is broken, it's clearly broken in a lot of ways. You look around and the fear and the prejudice and the hatred and the violence, like those things are real. But the answer is not to say, I have all the answers. The answer is not to retreat into a, 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 a place of tradition or a place of comfort and say, no, I'm just going to ignore everything because my theology works for me right now and my belief about God is, is comfortable because life is just bigger and crazier than that. And sometimes you're going to face situations, you know, tragedies, forces to confront the incongruencies in our belief systems, loss, betrayal, People in our lives that do things we didn't, ex didn't expect and suddenly we're forced like Jesus with this woman at the well to say, well, let's see, what are you, why are you saying this? And her, you know, she'd just been in this bubble her whole life in the Samaritan bubble and Jesus, something new. And so she's like, well, you people, you say this, but what? And Jesus came in and changed her whole mindset. And that's what Jesus continues to do. Change mindsets and change hearts and <laughs> give us more questions than answers sometimes. How many times did the disciples just scratch their heads and say, wow, that's a hard saying. I don't quite understand that. And sometimes Jesus would say, okay, let me explain my parable to you. And other times he didn't. They just wrote him down, you know, in the Gospels. And now here we are 2,000 years later saying, I'm not totally sure what he meant by that. And I think that's part of the point. Not to confuse us, but to remind us that God is God. We are humans. We are his creation. We serve him. We seek to know him. We'll never fully know him. It's impossible. He's God and we're humans, but we know him better and we walk closer to him and we, we get to understand him better and better and we 
receive his forgiveness and his grace and his wisdom for situations that are just beyond our understanding. You know, we're not very good at being God. It's the bottom line. Like, we don't have the answers. We don't have the strength to control our lives. We can't see the future. What we have is we have God. <laughs> we don't need to be God because we already have God. We can be humans. We can be like children, like Jesus himself said, and, you know, ask a few more questions and let our minds be changed a little quicker. Maybe say a few less opinions and have a few more questions in life. And honestly, God is not scared of that. He is not going to accuse you of being a heretic because you ask sacred, questions, sacred cow questions that no one has dared to ask before. Believe me, we've all asked them. Maybe not out loud, but in our hearts we're asking them. And it, you know, now more than ever, you can find answers or at least find opinions, find multiple opinions, and you can actually grow in your walk with God on your own. And as I've mentioned last week, and I'll continue to talk about this, really the passion that I think that I have for my own life, and I'm going to share it with you because you're a captive audience, right? Or semi-captive. I guess you could always turn off the video. But the, the, the passion that I have in my own heart is I don't want there to be things between me and God. I want there to be lots of things that help me know God. So I'm going to listen. I'm going to talk. I'm going to ask. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to see what people have said throughout the course of history. I'm going to do my homework. But at the end of the day, I just want God. And if the God, the way God reveals himself to me is slightly different than the way he reveals himself to you, I think that's only to be expected. And if my perceptions are different than yours, I think that's good. And if the way I understand my life, how life needs to be led is not the same as my fellow human, he's still my fellow human. And Jesus commanded us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And a lot of the conversations and the arguments and the fights, they won't ever be totally resolved because there's no clear answers. It's a lot of people with a lot of error, but also really good hearts trying to do the best they can. That's, that's a pretty good description of humanity. And there's one God. He's the only source of all life and truth and hope and knowledge and everything else. And we're not Him, but we get to know Him. We get to live with Him. And the crazy thing is, the more you draw close to God, the better you understand Him. I feel like the more you're able to love people and walk with people who don't agree with you and don't think the way you think. And I think that's a reflection of the very essence of God. He's by default, by definition, bigger than us. Therefore, it's going to take all of us to accurately reflect Him. His heart is bigger. His motivations are bigger. His, his understanding is bigger. His perspectives are bigger than any one of us, any one political party, any one ethnic group, any one doctrinal persuasion, any one church group. God's bigger than all of that. And yet He calls us to love one another. He calls us to, in humility, listen to one another and say, why do you feel that way? What is the pain point? What's the fear? What's the threat that, that you see that I don't see? Tell me because we're brothers, we're sisters. And together we can understand and we can overcome some of these issues. Together we can actually know God better and reflect God more. And at the end of the day, our theology has to lead us back to loving people. Or what's the point? Because God came to earth. That's the whole point of this, of this passage. He didn't just stay in heaven saying, nope, I want to be worshiped in a temple. Nope, on the mountain's cool too. He came and sat with this woman and drank water with her and said, hey, what's, you know, what are you thinking? What do you need? He talked to her about her life. He went with her into her town and talked with all of her friends and the people in town there. He's doing the same thing with each one of us. He's in our world, listening to the contradictions, the pain points, and the frustrations, and sometimes not answering them all. Sometimes just saying, you know what? I'm here though. I'm here and I want to go with you and I want you to love other people and I'm going to help you and you're going to love me more. And this, that's just, I think in times that are so chaotic and crazy, I think there's a, ref, a refreshing, um, a refreshing strength, a, a, a refreshing realization when we understand that we don't have to understand it all. We don't have to know it all, but we can know the one who does. We can trust him and love him and let ourselves be loved by him and show his love to other people. And honestly, together, we're going to enjoy life more. And I hope that helps you wherever you're at. If there's something you're going through, I know I didn't give you a lot of answers, but I think that's the whole point. It's okay to not have the answers, but we do have the answer. His name is Jesus. He's with us. He loves us. He knows you. He knows what you're going through. He cares about you deeply deeply, 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 his heart breaks with your pain. 
um, so many times we feel alone. I, I know that, you know, now maybe more than ever, ever, but we are not alone. And if there's one thing you can grasp in the midst of this, if you felt rejected by the church, you know, by theology, if you felt rejected by good people, by some ethnic group, by some culture, by some nation, God's arms are open wide for you. His arms are open wide for you, and He is asking you to put yourself in His arms, to open your heart again, to learn more, to love more, to not give up on humanity because He hasn't given up on us. We're in this together, and better days are ahead. I can promise you that. I'd like to finish with a quick prayer. Again, I don't, I don't know what you might be going through, but I know that God does, and He's with you. I'm going to pray that God will guide each decision, each step, and even the emotions that you might be feeling. Lord, we thank you for your love for us and for the certainty that we have in you, even in an uncertain life, even in times of storm. Lord, we know that you are with us, that your peace is ours, your strength is ours. We don't have to have it all figured out. God, we can simply draw close to you, we can simply listen to you and hear your heartbeat next to ours and feel your arms wrapped around us and hear your voice whispering in our ears. God, we ask, I ask that for each person watch, watching this video today, you would give us that closeness, that intimacy with you, that understanding, God, that passes all understanding, that you would help us grow in our knowledge more than ever, Lord. We want to understand. We want to see. We want to be wise. We want to have a better perspective. God, we also just want to know you. We want to rest in you day in and day out and know that you have this world in your hands and that your love is infinite and it is never going to end. It's with us every moment of every day. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey church, I hope you have enjoyed the message of today. We want to thank you so much for staying in tune week after week. We're so excited to be working on a special online space for our youth community. Uh, in the meantime though, if you have any prayer requests, if you would like us to pray along with you, or maybe you would like just to say what's up, you can follow us on any of our social media. Also, thehousegdl.com is a great resource for you to see the previous messages, also, there's a space over there if you would like to, um, to give online, if you feel compelled to do that. We're counting down the days to see you again. Uh, you have a great week. We love you so much.